As we continue our series on the seven motivations of the Christian life, today we are looking at part one of the imminent return of Jesus Christ. This is definitely a motivation that we find within the pages of Scripture. Now, now let me say this. Um, the reason we're spending two weeks on this is because uh, there is a lot of controversy today and a lot of defection leaving the doctrine of the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Uh, there's a, there's a, a big uh, uh, movement going on where people are leaving the pre-tribulational rapture position and moving on to mid-trib. Uh, some call it uh, uh, pre-trib, or not pre-trib. Um, there's another name for it. Anyways, it's basically, it's <clears throat> pre-wrath. That's what it is, pre-wrath, which is basically mid-trib. And um, it's just, it just doesn't fit. I had somebody uh, email me a couple weeks ago, and they said, well, boy, I love your position on the gospel and this and that. However, I think you're not getting it. This issue with you, you keep saying pre-trib rapture. It's not pre-trib. It's going to be mid-trib and all these. Please watch this video. I hear that. It's like, I don't have an hour and a half. But, but anyways, I thought, you know what? Let me hear the other side. I mean, it doesn't hurt, right? If you have the truth, you're not afraid of that. And I got about 15 minutes into it, and I thought, what a misrepresentation of what we believe. And that was that. That was that. He'll probably write me this week and say, you need to watch the whole thing. <laughs> probably not, but thanks anyway on that. Folks, nearly every time, nearly every time the rapture of the church is mentioned in the New Testament, it is either right before or right after a strong admonition for believers to live their lives for Jesus Christ. This is no doubt. Remember the big picture of the series. This has to do with motivations of the Christian life. The imminent return of Jesus Christ is a strong motivator. That is why believing in a pre-trib rapture, now you're free to believe anything you want on that, but uh, a pre-trib rapture, we actually have this as part of our doctrinal statement. Not only what we believe, but if you're going to be a member here, uh, this is what we want you to hold to as well, because this is the position we think fits Scripture the best, and this is what the only thing we'll allow to be taught in our church. And um, no give on that? No give. No give. That's, that's where we stand. Uh, but it's very important. Now, this issue of these, these strong admonitions to live for Christ, and we find them in the text, this is not an accident. And it points to the fact that the imminent return of Jesus Christ is a very strong motivator to live your life for Jesus Christ. We'll look at the practical aspect of that next week, but today I felt it important because of all the controversies going on on this issue to set the foundation and let you see clearly this best fits Scripture. Pre-trib rapture. With that in mind, I also want to mention to you, we just recently published our, our latest booklet. This is booklet number six, and it's entitled, Will You Be Left Behind? This is really being received well. This is a great witnessing tool, a great witnessing tool. Now, you can send, if you don't want to give somebody the hard copy or send it to them, you can send them a link on our website. I think it's at northlandchurch.com and also our new website, secureforever.org, and free resources there, and there's a PDF of this that you can download for free. So you could send somebody the link if, if they want to uh, read it that way. But we do have these. They're only $2 a piece. And um, if you come here regularly to church, you're not going to learn anything you don't already know. However, however, I will tell you this. Even if you do come regularly to church, you will be encouraged reading this. It'll get you excited. And you know what's neat about that? As you get excited, that's the work of the Holy Spirit confirming His Word in your life. And so this is powerful. Now, folks, the main reason I wrote this is as a witnessing tool to the lost. Okay? We not only don't want people to go to hell, we don't want them to get left behind when the rapture takes place. And so this will help them in a very straightforward, 
short but full of truth booklet talking about this issue and not only why we believe it, but also proof that we are in fact in the last days before Jesus comes back. And by the way, if you've been watching the news lately and all the stuff with AI and all the weird stuff going on with the World Economic Forum and the World Health Organization and all these things, they're all working together. It's in here, by the way. They're all working together to bring about a one world government, one world church, one world currency, okay? Digital currency, it's a one world currency. That's what it is. Okay, they want to get your money out of your hands to where they control all the transactions. And once they control all financial transactions, they control you. They control you. Anyways, get it if you don't already have it. And it's a great witnessing tool for people, okay? So let me just mention as we get into this, the imminent return of Jesus Christ. First thing we're going to look at today, we're covering three points, mainly two. We'll just mention the third because the third is what we're going to spend most of our time on next week. But our first point today is this. We're going to look at the fact of his coming. The fact of his coming. We know Jesus Christ came the first time. That's a matter of history. But he also promised that he would come a second time as well. And in John chapter 14... We see this mention, uh, Jesus is speaking. He says in John 14, 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. It doesn't stop there, though. Verse 3, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, now watch the language, and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. You notice he's not talking about here coming and establishing and setting up his kingdom. No, that will take place after the seven-year tribulation period. That's something separate. Now, many people, even some Christians, are skeptical about Jesus coming back to rapture us to heaven. There are many who at one time did believe that the rapture was imminent. They did believe in a pre-tribulational rapture, but they have since forsaken that position. And they'll say that Christians have been saying that he is coming ever since Jesus left. Well, there's some truth in that. He did, but that doesn't mean he's not coming. Now, what a mistake that is. Well, he, you know, Christians have been saying that ever since Jesus was here the first time. Yeah, and guess what? It's that much closer. All right, it's that much closer. It is true because the Lord told his disciples to be looking for him. But that doesn't change the fact that it is closer today than ever before. Now, hold your place here in John 14. Go with me to 2 Peter chapter 3 for just a moment. 2 Peter chapter 3. The fact that people are saying that as often as they are, the fact that believers are abandoning the position of the imminent return of Jesus Christ, these, these facts point to the fact that it is actually them saying it and people saying it and proclaiming it is an actual fulfillment of the Word of God. It's an actual prophetic fulfillment. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 3, Peter says this, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, mockers, walking after their own lusts and saying, Where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Nothing's changed. Where's the promise of, you know, you keep saying it, you keep saying it. Where is he? <laughs> well, you're going to see very clearly the mindset God wants us to have is spelled out in the Word of God. Now, back to John 14. Who are the ones that Jesus will receive unto himself? In other words, he's going to prepare a place for us, heaven, our dwellings there. Who will be going? To heaven? Good question. Well, he gives us the answer in John chapter 14 
And we're going to dwell on this for just a few minutes. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now remember the context here. I'm going to go to prepare a place. I'm going to come again, receive you unto myself. And then he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Now you notice there's four absolutes in that verse. Did you catch them? I am the way, the way, not a way, not part of the way. I am the truth, not a truth, not part of the truth. I am the life, not part of the way. And then he says, no man comes to the Father but by me. He didn't say, but by me and you. He says, by me. In other words, Jesus is talking about him being the exclusive Savior for mankind. That's the whole reason he came to earth, was to provide eternal life for us. And he did all that was necessary to be able to offer it to you and me as a free gift. As a free gift. In Romans chapter 5, in verse 8, it says this, But God commendeth or displayed his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Look at that, Romans 5, 8. God commended or displayed his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners. Do you know what that means, folks? You'll hear preachers say, you got to forsake all your sins before God will accept you. That's not what Romans 5, 8 says. God commended or displayed his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, we couldn't save ourselves. That's why Jesus came. If we could save ourselves, he would not have come. This is what people need to understand. Look up here. Let me illustrate it. This hand representing you and me. <clears throat> this representing our sin. Here we are. We're all sinners. The Bible tells us God loves us, but he hates our sin. See, sin separates us from him. You cannot go to heaven with even one sin. You could live a, a, a life of, try to live a life of good works, good deeds, good, good intentions. Do all you can. Be, give money to charity try to have a clean moral life, raise your family right. None of those things will pay for sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. If we die, folks, if we die with our sin, we're going to not only die with our sin, but we'll be lost forever. The Bible says death is separation. Yes, physical separation of the body and the soul, but it's also spiritual separation from God. God doesn't want that for us. And that is why Jesus came. That is why Jesus came. I'm hearing chimes. <laughs> it's not rapture time. <laughs> because if it was, we'd already be gone. Did you know that? Because it's going to happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. So you won't be sitting around wondering, is this the rapture? And we'll be once for all rid of our cell phones. Do I hear an amen? amen? All right. Look up here. If we pay for our sin, we'll be lost forever in hell. God says, I love you so much, I don't want you to be lost. See, religion, though, says, no, it's by good deeds. No, that's not what the Bible says, though. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. You're not saved of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. How am I going to get rid of my sin? If I die with it, I'll be separated from God forever. My good works won't pay for sin. Well, the best I can do will not get rid of my sin. What am I going to do? Yeah. That's why Jesus came. God commended his love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This hand representing Jesus Christ, the sinless Son of God, he went to the cross of Calvary, and he took that sin upon himself. He was the sacrificial lamb. He took that sin upon himself, and he made the death payment, leaving us nothing to pay for. He paid for all of your sin, all of it. Not only what you've done, but what you'll do to the day you die. Because when he died, 
You had not been born yet. All of your sin was in the future. If he paid for one, he paid for all, and he did. He died, was buried, and came back from the dead. And he says, if you will believe, put your faith in him that he did that for you, the moment you do, that payment is good on your behalf. He gives you everlasting life. All your sin is gone. If all your sin is gone, there's nothing to send you to hell. Nothing. If all your sin is gone, there's nothing to keep you out of heaven. But if you say, nah, I can't believe it. It's, it's too easy. That's this easy believism stuff. What is it, hard believism? Listen, friend, if Jesus did all the work and offers it as a gift, why can't you just believe what God says? Okay? Let me tell you something. If you're trusting in religion, you're not going to heaven. The only way you can be saved is put your faith in Jesus Christ. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And when you trust him as your Savior, he saves you by his grace. Because salvation is the gift of God, and it's not of works. And I love the last part, lest any man should boast. Do you know why a person will not believe that Jesus Christ has paid for all their sins and that he's the only way to heaven. Do you know why people won't believe that? you know why they reject it? It's because of their pride. Did you know that? Deep down, it's their pride. Their pride says, I have to do something. I have to, why? Because they want to get to heaven and say, look at me, look what I did. Let me tell you something, there'll be no braggers in heaven. It's all what Christ has done, the Lamb. And that's why we will bow down and worship at his feet, not each other's. Okay? So if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, trust him today. If you trust him today, you have the promise that when he comes, he's taking you home. You're going. Oh, but I fail at times. We all fail at times. But don't forget, when Jesus died on the cross, he paid for all sin. There's no sin that he did not pay for when he died on the cross. All he's asking you to do is believe that he did it for you. Now, turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And here we get into probably the most popular or... Uh, lengthy explanation of the rapture of the church. The rapture, the, the, the word rapture is not, yes, it's true, it's not in our English Bible, but it is in the Latin version. And the word rapture, we get it from the Latin word rapturo, but in our English text it says caught up. To be caught up is to be raptured. You know, some people say, oh, I heard the music, it was so it was so amazing. I was just, I was in rapture. They were caught up in it. That's the word. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, referring to believers who have already died, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. That's the unbeliever, has no hope. For if we believe, here it is again, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So at the rapture, they, those who have gone on to be with the Lord, are coming back with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord. You notice he says, we which are alive and remain. Don't, don't just pass it by. Paul is including himself in those who could very well be alive and remaining when Jesus comes back at the rapture. That we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, and that word means go before them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Those, those bodies that have died and disintegrated, God is going to put them back together. You might say, well, 
well, what about people who've been cremated and their ashes scattered in the sea and all that? It's not your problem. <laughs> if God could speak the universe into existence, I think he could figure out where my pieces are. <laughs> I'm not worried about it. I'm just excited it's going to happen. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. There it is, caught up. To meet the Lord in the air. Notice we don't meet him on earth, we meet him in the air. That's different than the second coming to earth. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Yeah, if you believe this, that should bring comfort to you and to me. Now, while, the rapture, while at the rapture we meet the Lord in the air, we also know that about seven years after the rapture, he is going to return again. That's why we call it the second coming to earth. The rapture, he doesn't come all the way to earth. But he will, at the end of the tribulation period, come all the way back to earth to set up his kingdom. But when will the rapture take place? People are always at, when's the rapture going to take place? Nobody knows when the rapture will take place. No one knows that. But the Bible teaches us, and here's the key, folks, and this is why this is a motivation. The Bible teaches us to be looking for the Lord at any moment. Okay? Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. I'm going to give you some scriptures here. Listen, do some study on these yourself. Meditate on them. I think it'll be an encouragement. Why do we hold to uh, uh, the pre-tribulational rapture, the imminent return of Jesus Christ? Well, it fits the Scriptures the best. That's why we hold to it. There's lots of support for that position. That's why we hold to it. Here in 1 Thessalonians 1.9, it says, For they themselves show us what manner of entering in we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. He's talking to believers here. They got saved, and then they turned to God from idols to serve the Lord. Now, that continues on, verse 10. And to wait. And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivers delivered us from the wrath to come. Now, I'm not sure why our Bible has delivered there in the sense of like a past tense, aorist tense, because it's actually in the present tense. And it's delivers. It's usually the way it would be translated. Okay? The word in verse 10, it says, and to wait for a son from heaven. The word wait is also in the present tense. We could say it, we could put it this way. And to be waiting for. In other words, present tense. It isn't, this is far away. No, this is something we should be looking for today. And to wait. And he's telling the Thessalonians. First Thessalonians was written early in the New Testament times, probably 15 years after Jesus was here, somewhere in there, early letter. And isn't it interesting Paul is telling the Thessalonians believers, you should be waiting and looking for Jesus. That's exactly what he says here. Which delivers us from the wrath to come. And I think the wrath to come here is talking about the tribulation. Now, turn with me over to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. Look at the language here. So important. Well, pastor, what does, it, what does it matter? I mean, as long as a person's trusted Christ as Savior, they're going to go to heaven, right? That's true. That is true. Okay? What does it matter? What it matters is it can have a profound effect on how you live your life, the amount of joy you have, the motivations you have in your Christian life. See, God, folks, God gives us a package, okay? There's a, there's a lot of things that go into what he's given us in salvation, So this is so important. James chapter 5 and verse 8, it says, James says, be ye also patient. By the way, James is another early one. Be ye also patient, 
Establish your hearts. Why? For the coming of the Lord draweth nigh, near. Be patient. Persevere is the idea. Establish your heart. Okay? Stay on track. Why? Jesus is coming soon. Verse 9. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge stands before the door. Is that not teaching the imminent return of Jesus Christ? If it's not, I don't know what it's teaching. He's there. You ever waited for somebody to come visit you? And you're waiting and you're waiting. They'll, they'll be here any time. You're having somebody over for dinner or something like that. They'll be here any time. And, and you're, you're wondering if I'm going to hear footsteps. Or you hear somebody on the front. They're, they're waiting at the door. And then a ding dong. If you have a dinger. If not a... Behold, they're waiting at the door. You're anticipating. You're anticipating. You're anticipating. That is exactly what verse 9 is talking about. Behold, the judge stands at the door. Let me show you another one. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. We are to be waiting. Now, as you're turning there, let me say this. Those who believe in a pre-wrath rapture or a mid-trib rapture, okay, and there, 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 there are little differences depending on who, who they are, who's talking about it, but they're basically the same idea, all right? They believe that the rapture will take place right before the last part of the tribulation takes place. That's, that's their belief. I don't buy it. But, but here, here's the point, folks. Listen. Listen carefully. If there are things that have to take place before Jesus comes, which if you believe in a pre-wrath rapture or mid-trib rapture, then you're not waiting for the rapture. You're waiting to see signs of the first half of the tribulation in Scripture. And those are very clear, by the way. Study Revelation chapter 6 through 19, also study Matthew 24 and, and the other parts of the other uh, synoptic gospels on that. See, the only ones who are truly waiting, who are expecting Jesus at any moment, are those who believe that he could come at any moment. Not those who say, well, there's things that have to take place first in the first half of the tribulation before I get raptured. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says we ought to be looking all the time. Well, if there are no signs for the rapture, and there are not, then we need to be looking. Now, there are signs and trends for the tribulation period. And we know, and we've covered this many times, that we are getting very close to the seven-year tribulation period because of what we're seeing in the world. Now, if Jesus is coming before that seven-year period begins... If we're getting close to the tribulation period, we know we're getting even closer to the rapture, even though it hasn't happened yet. Well, what, but, but wait, Pastor, what about the people way, way back, you know, uh, let's say after AD 100 or whatever, um, uh, you know, uh, what about the tribulation for them? Listen, listen, folks. The pre-tribulational rapture, if that is how it's going to be, which is what we believe the Bible teaches, that fits every age from the time Jesus was here to the days in which we live. It's the only position that does. Because the others, you have to have other things take place. Therefore, why are you eagerly anticipating Jesus to come when a lot of the signs of the last days have not even shown up yet? Okay? No, he told us, he taught us to be looking. And that is why we're looking. We may not understand it all. We may not understand how things are going to happen in the world, how all the details are going to come together. But I'll tell you what, we have the privilege today, 2023, we have the privilege today to see things that no generation has ever seen before in the history of the world. And it all points to a pre-tribulational rapture. 
Philippians 3.20, for our conversation, our citizenship is in heaven. From whence also we look, we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Back up to verse 20, it says, from also we look for the Savior. In verse 20, the word look means to eagerly await. And by the way, yes, again, it is in the present tense. In other words, by which also we are looking for Jesus. We're eagerly waiting to see him. You know what that tells me? That tells me no signs have to be fulfilled of the tribulation period before Jesus can show up. Otherwise, why would we be eagerly looking for him? It all fits. The book of Revelation, which is literally the revelation of Jesus Christ, is written to the church to tell us what will happen in the future. Now, the book of Revelation has a built-in outline. Did you know that? Revelation 1, verse 19, things which have been, things which are, things which will be, it talks about there. Okay, things that have been, that's chapter 1 of the book of Revelation. Things which are, that's the church age, Revelation 2 and 3. Things that will be hereafter, chapters 4 through chapter 22. Don't you think it's interesting that at the end of the verses that have to do with the seven churches, the first verse in chapter 4, the command comes and it says, come up hither. And he's caught up. Hmm. Sounds an awful like, awful a lot like the rapture, doesn't it? Revelation 3.11. Behold, I come quickly. This is Jesus speaking. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Revelation chapter 22. Very interesting to me, and I just realized this. I never saw it before. We have this in Revelation 3.11, Behold, I come quickly. Of course, chapter 4 through chapter 19, the church is nowhere mentioned. But he's writing Revelation to the churches, because that's what he says in chapter 1. But the church is back at the end of Revelation 19. And we are here for the kingdom age. We're here during that period of time. And isn't it interesting that the last chapter in the book of Revelation, which, by the way, remember, the book of Revelation is written to the churches. It says in Revelation 22, 7, Behold, I come quickly. Revelation 22, 12, And behold, I come quickly. Revelation 22, 20, Halfway through, surely I come quickly. What's he trying to say? (laughs) He's coming quickly. Now, this was written approximately AD 95. John would have been flabbergasted to see what we see today, he would have been flabbergasted. Folks, we know we are close because while there are no signs for the rapture of the church, there are signs for the coming tribulation period which will come upon the whole world. If we have to go through certain events of the tribulation before the rapture takes place, then we cannot say the Lord could come back at any moment. Because he couldn't if certain things have to happen before he comes back. But nothing has to happen before the rapture. That's why it's imminent, and that's why the Bible writers kept saying, we're waiting, we're looking, okay? Titus, I didn't give you this one because of time, but Titus chapter 2, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. He's coming. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Just a few more verses here today. 1 Corinthians 15.
and again. This is not just, uh, today I'm setting the foundation of next week. What we're covering today, folks, this is not just th theological facts or, or perspective. This has profound impact on how we live our lives. And that's the motivation part, and that's what we're looking at next week. In 1 Corinthians 15, 51, it says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Why does he call it a mystery? Because the church age was a mystery. The church age was a mystery. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. That goes, verse 52 goes perfectly with 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17. Now, how should all this affect us? Well, it should motivate us to serve the Lord. And this leads us to our last point today, and where we'll pick up next week, number three, the preparation for his coming. Today we've seen the fact of his coming. We've established that. We've seen the imminency of his coming. We've established that, which leads us to number three, the preparation for his coming. If we are believers already, we need to be faithful. We need to be abiding in Christ, living for him, living pure lives, folks, sharing the gospel like we've never done it before. I'm talking about we need to step up. We need to step up. We need to boldly speak the truth in love. Say, well, I'm afraid of what somebody thinks. Forget about what people think. Their soul is in the balance. Their eternal destiny is in the balance. You're in 1 Corinthians 15. Look at verse 58. It says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Don't you think it's interesting that here's this admonition to faithfully serve Christ? And where is it placed? Right after the doctrinal section of talking about the imminent return, the rapture of the church. These things, you'll always find them around each other because it's such a strong motivator. Now let me say this today. Listen carefully. If you have not trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you need to put your faith in Him today. You need to put your trust in Him today. He could come back at any moment. And if you have not trusted Christ, you will be left behind. And can I tell you this? As bad as the next seven years after that will be, which Jesus said will be the worst time in human history. As bad as that is, it is just a foretaste of hell itself. It will be hell on earth before it's hell in eternity. So I urge you to put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior. It is a win-win situation. You not only have the guarantee of eternal life in heaven, but you have the guarantee that when Jesus comes back, you are going to be with him. You're going to be caught up to meet the Lord near. Oh, how I have prayed and wished and hoped and thought about and discussed with others. What a wonder it would be. And oh, Lord, please make it happen that we could be raptured on a Sunday morning when we're all here in church. Wouldn't that just be amazing? All of a sudden, Hopefully, no one's left. All Bibles, all notebooks, all purses, all pillows. No, just kidding. <laughs> Fall to the ground. Wouldn't that be glorious? No wonder it's called the blessed hope. One last verse in John chapter 6. Jesus put it as simply as he possibly could. You know, you couple John 6.47 with John 14.6, I mean, it's just amazing. John 6, verse 47, he said this. He said, verily, verily, that means truly, truly, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath 
possessed us right now. Everlasting life. If you will put your faith, your trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, that moment he gives you everlasting life. How long is that? It's forever and ever and ever. It never stops. Never stops? What if I sin? You trusted him as your Savior, as the one who paid for all your sin. He said that payment, when you believe, is put to your account. That's why you can know that you have eternal life. Because he promised it. He did the work. He promised that the transaction was made, and you, when you believe, become a child of God forever that very moment. If you've never trusted Christ, would you do it today? Could we all bow in prayer, please, today with all heads bowed and all eyes closed? Please, no one looking around. Perhaps you're here and you've never understood this until today. I get that. No one is born saved. No one is born a child of God. But if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, would you do it right now, right where you sit? Right where you sit, between you and God. He knows your thoughts. You cannot make a mistake. Why don't you talk to him right now? Okay? There's no formal prayer or anything. Lord, I am trusting in Jesus Christ. I put my faith in him that he has paid for all my sins. I believe that. I believe he did that for me. Friend, he promises you the moment you trust in Christ, not depending on yourself, but on what Jesus did for you on the cross, he gives you everlasting life as a free gift. If you're holding on to good works to get you to heaven, you're never going to go there because you're denying the fact that Jesus alone is the Savior. He's the only way you get to heaven. Would you trust in him today? Would you do that? Well, friends, that concludes this edition of Voice of Assurance. Thanks so much for listening. And would you share this ministry with a friend? To contact us or learn more about our ministry, please visit www.northlandchurch.com. Your prayers and support for this ministry are greatly appreciated. Thank you so much, and God bless you.